Well, the passage of Scripture that we will be examining today is a passage of Scripture that is about passion. It's a passage of Scripture that is about reward, affections, and desire. Today, we are going to discover a Christianity that is largely foreign to the American evangelical mindset in which we live. We are going to see a Christianity that is radically countercultural. We are going to examine a Christian whose affections and mind was so totally eternity focused and driven by God's glory that if he were to walk into many of our churches today, he would be likely labeled as a hyper Christian or a fringe radical. What we are going to examine today is our study of the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. You can turn there with me. We are in chapter 1 of Philippians. And we've come now to the second half of verse 18. Philippians chapter 1, second half of verse 18. What we have been doing is searching the book of Philippians, to find the sources of joy that the Apostle Paul was experiencing. The Apostle Paul was a joy-filled man. Even as he writes this epistle, what has commonly been become known as the epistle of joy, the Apostle Paul, as we will see further, was in prison. We're looking through this book to discover what is the fuel of Paul's joy. Remember our definition of joy. Joy in the Lord is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he opens our eyes to behold the beauties and glories of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's our running definition of joy in the Lord throughout this book. And Paul was certainly feeling that good feeling as he basked in the glories and the beauties of Christ. Last week we saw that Paul's joy was ignited and fueled by the fact that through his being in prison, the gospel was advancing. Do you remember that? Verses 12 to the first half of 18. Through Paul being in jail, the gospel is being proclaimed. And in that, he rejoices. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He exclaims in verse 12. Almost with a a hint of glee, isn't it? The Philippians were worried about Paul. And he goes, guys, I want you to know, me, in jail, this is good. This This is good. This is advancing the gospel. Again, in verse 18, he says this. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. The source of Paul's joy is that through his imprisonment, the gospel is advancing. Well, today we are going to see another source of Paul's joy. And perhaps what you could label as the underlying or the root or major source of his joy in the Lord. We're going to find it in the second half of verse 18 all the way through verse 26. So please read along or follow along as I read Philippians 1, 18b through 26. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life 
or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. We are going to consider four points today from these eight and a half verses. First, Paul's primary concern for Christ's honor, or Paul's great concern for Christ's honor. Secondly, we'll see Paul's profound commitment to Christ's honor. Third, we'll look at Paul's mixed feelings about how Christ should be honored. And then fourthly and finally, we'll see Paul's expectant hope of Christ being honored through his deliverance. So, let's discover these one at a time. First, Paul's great concern for Christ's honor. Look there in verse 18. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, upon initially reading this, if we were to stop at verse 19, it may seem that the source of Paul's joy is the confidence he has in being delivered. You see that? I will rejoice, for I know, through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, I'm going to be delivered. See, that seems to be the source of Paul's joy, deliverance. I don't believe that's actually the underlying source of joy here. There's a greater source. Paul actually has a higher goal, a greater concern, an even deeper underlying fuel for joy. The main concern of the Apostle Paul is that Jesus Christ would be honored. That is his ultimate goal. You see it there? And so... Paul says he's going to rejoice because through the Philippians' prayers, the help of the Spirit of Jesus, he'll be delivered. But what I want you to notice, the result of his deliverance is what? The honoring of Christ. You see that? In other words, the deliverance is the means to the highest goal of Christ being honored. Does that make sense? Now, this is the chief end of Paul's life. As the Westminster Catechism so wonderfully asks and answers, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And brothers and sisters, friends, this ought to be the chief end, the chief goal of your life as well. You know that, right? You were created for the purpose of honoring God, to bring glory, honor, and praise to your Creator. It's what you were made to do. R.C. Sproul considers this point right here to be the major problem in most or many of our churches in this country. Quote, This is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are, unquote. That's R.C. Sproul. The chief end of your life is to bring praise, honor, and glory to the one who made you. You realize that God is the total, absolute owner of everything. Every single molecule existent on this planet, existent in this universe, mind you, the universe we don't even know the full expanse of, don't even know how big it is, every single molecule in the entire created universe is absolutely, totally His. 
It was made by God, and it was made for God. He thought it. He designed it. He created it. He owns it. He sustains it. He rules it. Every single square inch. God is the owner. Abraham Kuyper famously said, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. And this sovereign, omnipotent, majestic, glorious, ruling king created you and me for a purpose. What is that purpose? His glory. We hear the praise being given in Revelation 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for You created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God did not make you in all of your beautiful complexity and in all of your astounding intricacy and bring you into this glorious realm of his created order so that you could run around and fulfill your own selfish, wicked lust. It's simply not why you've been created and why you are being sustained. You actually have a purpose here for being, for being here, and that purpose is not to eat, drink, and be merry. God has given you the purpose to exist for His glory. You realize this is why sin is so horrid. This is why sin is so heinous. The effects of sin are not so horrid because of the effects they have upon your body or upon others' bodies or their sensibilities or their emotions. That's not why sin is so horrible. The horror of sin is bound up in the effects it has upon the glory of God. You've got to understand this. When God looks down upon the children of man in Genesis 6 and sees that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually, it is because the thoughts of man's heart was only self-centered, idolatrous, vain worship. They had rejected the purpose of their being created. And so instead of worshiping and serving their creator, they worshiped and served themselves. And so God looks down and sees every single intent of their heart is pure wickedness. And if you think that was only a problem for them then, you're wrong. We are infected with the same disease that they were back in Genesis. The disease of misplaced worship. The disease of self-idolatry. The disease of sin. My friends, this is how we've got to define sin. Against the backdrop of God's glory. We do not define sin against the backdrop of cultural expectations. We define sin against the backdrop of who God is and why you have been made. Do you see that? So for you to define sin as, well, murder sin because I took someone else's life, you're right, that is a sin, but the essence of sin is not what it does against others. The essence of sin is what it does against the glory of the one who made you. Sin is defined against the backdrop of the glory of God, against the backdrop of his absolute, total, 
ownership of your life and the horrid effects your sin has on that glory. You are not your own. You're not an autonomous being. Your life is not your life. You are owned by your maker, and thus your maker has absolutely every right to dictate how you are to live. Now, say that in the public square, and perhaps some of you are squirming. You don't like that. Don't tell me what to do, right? But think about this. You go to the store, you get some supplies, you come home, in your garage, you make a beautiful espresso <coughs> machine. You made an espresso machine because... You need it in the morning, you need that kickstart. So you make this espresso machine, you put beans in there, you get it grinding, it turns on. And this machine you designed for the purpose of that beautiful espresso, which smells so good in the morning, starts spewing out sewage and filth. What do you do to that machine? What is it good for? To be destroyed. My friends, you were made for the purpose of glorifying God with your mind, with your words, with your actions, with your emotions, with your expressions, with your desires, with your affections. And instead of using all of your faculties to glorify and honor God, you have instead spewed forth the filth and sewage of self-love and self-gratification and self-interest and self-idolatry. You are fit for nothing more than to be destroyed in your rebellion against your Creator. This is why when the Bible calls forth men to repent, they're not giving a suggestion, but they're giving a command. <clears throat> Acts 17, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Yes. This is not a suggestion for your mulling over. This is a command of the Almighty God to be reconnected with the purpose for why you were made. And if not, you will be fit only for destruction. And so we not, ought not to think it strange that for the Apostle Paul, his primary great concern was that Jesus Christ be honored. You see, Paul is not an anomaly. He's not an out of place, abnormal, strange Christian. Huh. He's just all about the glory of Christ. No, that's what it means to be a Christian. Yeah, amen. You're being reconnected with your purpose to glorify God. So Paul's primary concern was that Christ be honored. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Consider with me, secondly, then, Paul's profound commitment to Christ's honor. Look at the last part of verse 20. Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's commitment to Christ's honor is so profound, so radically eternity, so radically God-focused, that he desires to, be, to honor Christ whether he lives or dies. Paul's commitment to Christ being honored does not have attached to it the conditions of ease, comfort, long life, prosperity, or anything else. No conditions attached. I want Christ honored, whether by me dying or living. Full stop. You see that? Now notice how Paul tells us that he would actually succeed or fail to honor Christ in his life or death. Look at verse 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored. Paul's telling us how he's either going to fail or succeed in honoring Christ. And it's this. If Paul was ashamed of Jesus, Christ would be dishonored. But if Paul with courage is unashamed of Christ, Christ will be honored. What does it mean for Paul to be ashamed of Christ? Well, very simply, it means that Paul would renounce the facts of Christ. He would deny the truth about Jesus and his gospel. 
in order to be released from prison and have his life spared. Okay, so we've got to remember where Paul is. And we're going to go into that in a moment. Paul's in jail. So for him to be ashamed of Christ would mean he says, forget it, forget the facts of Christ. Let me out of jail. What does it mean for Paul to have full courage and not be ashamed of Christ? Well, it means that Paul, despite the persecutions, the beatings, the imprisonment, and threat of even being killed, to be courageous means he's not going to deny Jesus. That's pretty simple, right? Think about it for a moment. Paul's in prison for his preaching the gospel. Therefore, the charges would be dropped if Paul denied the gospel and promised to stop preaching it. John Bunyan, the, the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, was kind of in the same situation in 1660 in England when he was arrested under the reign of King Charles II. John Bunyan, this preacher of the gospel, remained in prison for 12 years. He was actually, throughout those 12 years, could have been freed at any moment. They would have let him go. All he had to do was promise not to preach the gospel. So as he's in prison with his wife and children out for 12 years, John Bunyan refused to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is a similar situation with Paul. Listen again to Paul's resolve. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. But now with courage as always, Christ is going to be honored. Where did he get this resolve? It actually came from something that Jesus Christ told him while he was in prison. You don't have to turn there, but in Acts 23, verse 11, Jesus Christ actually supernaturally visits Paul soon after he's arrested in Jerusalem. And listen to what Jesus says to Paul. Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Don't you hear that echoing in Paul's words here? I'm going to be courageous. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to be courageous. Because Christ had actually come to him and said, be courageous, Paul. Testify about me. Don't be ashamed. Jesus encouraged Paul. Paul would have had that replaying in his mind over and over as his raw resolve and determination to not be ashamed of Christ would have strengthened. Jesus knew the temptation for Paul would be to grow scared, to lose courage, to lose heart, and ultimately to deny the Lord Jesus Christ in order to gain his freedom. The, the fact of the matter is there was severe pressure on Paul. He was being beaten he was being treated as a criminal in prison. You realize that Paul, soon after his arrest, 40 of his own countrymen declared a fast whereby they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. Paul's life was on the line. Why? Simply because he proclaimed the gospel. And let me be clear, if it isn't already... The solution for Paul to get out of jail and his life off the line is to deny the facts of Christ. But Paul knows that to do so would be to bring dishonor and shame to the name of Christ. You see, Paul recognized that upon his shoulders rested the honor of Christ, the reputation and the honor of Jesus before these wicked men rested on Paul's shoulders. And Christian, I wonder if you today recognize that same reality for you. For those of you who claim to be Christians, you are claiming a phenomenal thing. You're saying, I'm united with the Godhead. I am a purchased son or daughter of God. You're claiming to be a trophy in the trophy case of God's glory. One who's been called out of darkness into his marvelous light for the purpose of proclaiming his excellencies. You recognize what you're putting on your shoulders when you say, I am a Christian, right? I'm a bought one. I'm a purchased one. I'm a loved one. 
Christ died for me. I'm united to the Godhead. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm set free from it. So Christian, bearing that name on your shoulders, when you then go to deny Christ, whether by your words or by your life, you are bringing dishonor to the name that you claim to bear. Do you see that? Paul recognized that. Before these wicked men, these Romans and these Jews, upon my shoulders the name of Christ and his honor is resting. If I am ashamed of Christ, Christ is dishonored before them. That's the correlation. And so profoundly committed was Paul to bringing honor to that name that rested upon his shoulders that his life either being taken or spared was of no consequence. He just wanted Christ honored, whether by life or by death. And Christians, so it must be for us that the main concern of our lives be the honoring of Christ even unto death. And my question for you to ponder is, do you live your life with the daily recognition that if you're claiming to be a Christian, the honor of Christ is riding on your shoulders before those whom you live? Do you live your life with that realization that Paul had? Consider with me thirdly, Paul's mixed feelings about how Christ should be honored. From verses 21 through 26, we find a very interesting dimension to this whole thing. We get a view into the emotional wrestlings of Paul as he contemplates and considers what his fate before Caesar might be. And what we'll discover is that his emotional wrestlings may not be what you'd expect them to be. Starting in verse 21, we see Paul does something here. He puts side by side life and death. And he compares the two of them to determine which one he would actually prefer. Look at, listen to this, verse 21. Now, put it, put it a little chart in your mind here. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now, this is absolutely phenomenal. The emotional wrestling is probably not what you thought it would be. When we hear someone stand up at church, perhaps they've just come off the mission field, or, or perhaps it's a young person with this newfound resolve, and, and they talk about their passion for Christ, of going to the ends of the earth for Christ, and we hear them say, I'd even be willing to die for Jesus Christ. We applaud. And we look at one another and say, wow. Sacrifice, right? They'd even be willing to die for Jesus. But then we look around at our nice, soft, comfortable, posh, cushy American lives and think, but maybe I'm not willing to die for Jesus. The thought of death for Christ, if we're honest, seems radical, doesn't it? That's a radical Christianity of that missionary. They'd even be willing to die. How selfless of them. But if you noticed, that is not the emotional wrestling of the apostle. His struggle is absolutely opposite. 
This is why I said at the outset that we're going to see here in this passage a type of Christianity that is radically countercultural. A type of Christianity that would be considered fringe and lunatic in our society. We're looking at a Christian who would be called hyper Christian. We're going to examine a Christian, I said, whose affections are so radically antithetical to the affections of modern Christianity in the West. Here's why. Paul's emotional struggle is not with facing death, but with facing life. Paul is torn by his desires to die and be in glory with Christ. Do you see that? Look, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Which I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. Listen, this is language of desire. This is language of affection. Look at it, verse 23. My desire is to be with Christ for that is far better. Paul's affections and desires are to be at home with his Lord in heaven. Paul is not dreading passing over and through the cold, dark waters of death because he's visioning, he's seeing the glory beyond it. Do you see that? My friends, this tension in Paul's emotions is, if we're honest, an alien tension. For many of us, isn't it? A foreign tension. An emotional wrestling that we may know nothing about. He wants to be in heaven. The sacrifice for Paul is staying here. Now, our excuse may be this. Well, for goodness sake, look at the life of Paul. Pretty pretty miserable life beatings, whippings, shipwrecks, hungry, in danger. Of course Paul wanted out. Look at his life. But me? My life's too good. I don't want out just yet. Look, I mean, we've got our soft, middle-class American comforts. That's not the reason Paul wanted out. Paul's desire to be in heaven was greater than his desire to be in this life, not because he was negatively consumed with the painful dimensions of his life. His desire to be in heaven rather than in this life was because he was positively consumed with the glorious dimensions of heaven. Do you see that? It's not because he went, my life is so hard, I just got to get out. It was because he beheld the beauties of the life to come and said, I want to get there. This is exactly what we hear from him in his letter to the Corinthians when he says in 2 Corinthians 4, This light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now notice this. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Why did Paul have an emotional wrestling about wanting to be in glory and not here? Because his eyes were set on the unseen glories of heaven. Not because he was looking at the temporal pains. Paul had beheld the glories of heaven and it made all of this life shrivel in comparative glory. He comprehended and understood that heaven meant unbridled, unbroken, unmitigated, untainted communion and fellowship and intimacy with Jesus Christ, his Savior. Paul was not a depressed introvert who simply hated this life and considered death to be a better alternative. 
Paul was a man infatuated with the realities of what heaven had in store, and everything else lost its shimmer and shine. And my plea for you today is that you too, like the Apostle Paul, would get a taste of glory. Paul had so tasted of it that he wanted more. My plea to you is that you would not look at the Christian who's suffering with cancer or depression or sorrow and say, wow, well, they must really be longing for heaven. But me, everything's good. I want you in your comfortable, middle class, cozy, cushy, American life to be craving heaven more and more. That'll happen if you're setting your eyes where they need to be set. This kind of Christianity, this is the kind of Christianity with its sights set on eternity, set on glory, it's the kind of Christianity that flips the world upside down. Look at what our American Christianity has produced. I read an article by Pastor Al Baker in Banner of Truth this week called The Canaanites Had No Bible. God commanded the destruction of the Canaanites and other pagan Gentiles who had no Bible because of their pure, utter wickedness. They were perverse beyond measure. America is saturated with Bibles. And what it has, has it produced? A sexual revolution of horrific perversion. A rebellion and distortion of truth in our postmodern thought, which is radically illogical and God-hating. Yeah. And we're saturated with Bibles. American Christianity has not flipped this world upside down. But my plea to us today is that we would live this Pauline Christianity. Yeah. This biblical Christianity that would be radical, countercultural. As we set our sights on glory. Amen. I mentioned John Bunyan earlier. He spent 12 years in prison though he could have been released if he'd simply promised not to preach. But he spent 12 years in prison because he refused not to promise to preach. Now, whilst in prison, Bunyan made wonderful use of the time, writing a total of nine books, one of which has gone on to be, according to multiple sources, the number two best-selling book ever, second only to the Bible, the name of which is Pilgrim's Progress. It's the story of a man named Christian. It's an allegory. So you'll find different characters named Christian and evangelist and hopeful and, and uh, the giant of despair, I think, right? Um, or no, giant of, I forget his name. But it's an allegory depicting the Christian life. It's about a man named Christian and his journey to the celestial city, which is heaven. I want to read to you some of the closing words of this glorious book written by Bunyan. We're going to pick up right where Christian, who's accompanied by his friend Hopeful, have just passed through the river of death. And they approach the shores of glory. They're greeted by two shining men who are described by themselves as ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those that shall be heirs of salvation. Who are they? Those are angels. Let's pick up and read how Bunyan describes the conversation between Christian and Hopeful and these two angels as they approach the gate of heaven. This is Bunyan now. The talk they had with the shining ones, Hopeful and Christian with the angels, was about the glory of the place who told them that the beauty and glory of it was inexpressible. There, said the angels, is Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
the innumerable company of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. You are going now, said they, to the paradise of God, wherein you shall see the tree of life and eat of the never fading fruits thereof. And when you come there, you shall have white robes given you, and your walk and talk shall be every day with the king, even all the days of eternity. There you shall not see again such things as you saw when you were in the lower region upon the earth, sorrow, sickness, affliction, and death, for the former things are passed away. You are going now to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, and to the prophets, men that God hath taken away from the evil to come, and that are now resting upon their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. Christian and hopeful then asked, What must we do in the holy place? To whom it was answered, You must there receive the comfort of all your toil, and have joy for all your sorrow. You must reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers and tears and sufferings for the king, by the way. In that place you must wear crowns of gold, and enjoy the perpetual sight and visions of the Holy One, for there you shall see him as he is. There also you shall serve him continually with praise, with shouting and thanksgiving. Whom you desire to serve in the world, though with much difficulty because of the weakness of your flesh, there your eyes shall be delighted with seeing, and your ears with hearing, and the pleasant voice of the Mighty One. There you shall enjoy your friends again that have gone before you, And there you shall with joy receive even every one that follows into the holy place after you. There also you shall be clothed with glory and majesty and put into a fit, a ride fit with the king of glory. When he shall come with sound of trumpet in the clouds as upon the wings of the wind, you shall come with him. And when he shall sit upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him. Yea, and when he shall pass sentence upon all the workers of sin, let them be angels or men, you shall have a voice in that judgment because they were his and your enemies. Also, when he shall again return to the city, you shall go too with sound of trumpet and be ever with him. Now, while they were thus drawing towards the gate, behold, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them, to whom it was said by the other two angels, These are the men that have loved our Lord when they were in the world, and have left all for his holy name. And he hath sent us to fetch them, and we have brought them thus far on their desired journey, that they may go in and look their Redeemer in the face with joy. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Every single line, their scriptures, displaying for us the beauty of the eternal glory where we're waiting. Allow yourself to get raptured into that thought of what is promised for the Christian. For those who hold to the testimony of Jesus unwavering, what is promised for you? Unending bliss and joy. Pleasures at the right hand of God. Perfect communion with your Savior. Though you do not yet see Him, you love Him, there you shall see Him. No more temptations to sin. No more flesh with which you have to wrestle. Unbridled fellowship and intimacy with your Savior. Christian, do you see now why Paul wrestled as he did? He wanted to be home. He wanted to be with Jesus. He longed for it. He hoped for it. He wanted to be delivered to heaven. Please, do not pity the Christian who so longs for heaven that you pity him as a fringe radical. 
pity yourself if you count the earthly treasures of greater worth and gain than heavenly pleasure. Paul emotionally wrestled because his sights were set on glory. Consider with me fourthly and, and finally and briefly. Paul's expectant hope of Christ being honored through his deliverance. If you notice, Paul is confident that he's going to be delivered or Christ is going to be honored through his being delivered. He says in verse 19, I know through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. What kind of deliverance is Paul speaking of which is going to result in the glory and honor of Christ? I think for those of us who are at all acquainted with the Apostle Paul, we can confidently say the deliverance he's speaking of is not essentially deliverance from a prison cell, right? We've just spent verse after verse talking about how he's joy-filled because he's in prison. I hardly think that he's rejoicing because he's going to get out of jail. The deliverance Paul is speaking of is not strictly physical from jail. Paul knows that he will be absolutely delivered because this deliverance, now notice that word in the Greek is soteria. It literally means salvation. Paul knows that he will be saved either by his freedom from jail physically or by his being set free to glory in heaven. Either way, Paul is going to be saved, whether by life or death. And it's in that deliverance Paul desires Christ to be honored through his deliverance. So, his expectant hope that Christ be honored through his deliverance. Now, Paul's next words, and for sake of time we won't go in depth, but Paul's convinced that he is actually going to be delivered physically. Um, you, if you noticed in the wrestlings between life and death, he says in verses 25 and 26, fully convinced that it's better for you that I stay, I, God's going to deliver me physically. So he really did believe, he was convinced, he didn't have a word from God, but he, he was convinced that Caesar wasn't going to execute him. Um, and I want to close with just two simple applications about that point, and then we'll be done. Paul knew that God would deliver him, whether by life or by death. Application number one. God is so sovereignly in control that whatever happens, Paul can rest assured that it is for his glory. Paul is so resting in the sovereignty of God that he says, I'm going to be delivered either out of jail or die. But win-win, because God's going to save me one way or the other, and it's going to be for his glory. To live is Christ and to die is gain. What Paul is saying is like that old hymn of old from 1675 called Whatever You Ordain Is Right, O oh God, what you ordain is right, here shall my stand be taken, though sorrow, need, or death be mine, yet I am not forsaken, your watchful care is round me there, you hold me that I shall not fall, and so to you I leave it all. Resting in the sovereign arms of God. Do you live your life this way? For Paul... There was no bad option. You realize that? He was held in the arms of God, working all things. And he said, if you free me from jail, Caesar, great, I'll keep serving Christ. If you execute me, great, you've set me free to heaven. But God's holding me. Whatever he ordains is right. Do you live your life with that understanding? Are you living your life in that kind of freedom? That's freedom, isn't it? Not controlled by your circumstances? To know that whatever takes place, you embrace it with joy? You realize that? People say they're free, and then take their money away, take their health away, and watch their reaction. True freedom, like Paul, is to be in jail and say, kill me, great, 
Free me. Great. Whatever you ordain, your will be done. Second application, Paul embraced his life selflessly. He fully understood that his life was not his own. Yes, he'd rather go to glory with his Savior, but remember, to live is Christ. Which means to live is to glorify, honor, and serve Jesus. And Paul was convinced, the best way that I can honor and glorify and serve Jesus is by remaining here still yet longer to serve his church. And so Paul rejoices in the outcome he's persuaded of, that he'll be released from prison. Why? Because it is best for the Philippians in their progress and joy in the faith. Paul is realizing and growing convinced that his ministry to the Philippians isn't yet complete. And so he believes God's going to keep him for a while yet longer. Brothers and sisters, friends, I told you that we were going to see a Christianity that is radically countercultural. I told you that we were going to see a Christian who by today's standards would be labeled crazy, fringe, hyper-Christian. But isn't this the kind of Christianity you want to live? Don't you want to live swimming in the realm of freedom like Paul, who counted death as gain and life as Christ? Don't you want that? Don't you want to be set free from being enslaved by your circumstances to embrace any and all circumstance with joy? I want that. And I want that for you. And let me just give a quick application to any of you sitting here tonight, this morning, this afternoon who don't have that peace and joy. You will never experience the peace of the life of Paul. To embrace suffering and circumstance with joy, knowing it's producing the glory and honor of Christ, until you've been reconnected with your purpose in this life. To honor and glorify God. And the one thing that is breaking your connection with God is sin. And Jesus Christ, in his life, fulfilled the righteousness you could not. And in his death, paid the penalty you deserve in order that the consequence of sin, the slavery of sin, the power of sin, the guilt of sin in your life the sin that's keeping you from connecting with your Savior and your purpose could be removed. And Christ is calling you today. Christ is commanding you today to repent of your sin and to put your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. I pray that you would accompany it by your Spirit to the eyes of those hearing. In the name of Christ, amen.